So welcome, uh, Victor Strecker. And uh, I'm really especially glad that we're having this conversation because we both think having a purpose in life is extremely important, vital. Yeah, and uh, I have to say, I, you know, when when you invited me on, I took a look at your background a bit, just to see, you know, learn more about you and and what you've been doing is so impressive as well. So I kind of hope that we can kind of have a conversation and, you know, more than an interview, I, as if we're just sharing coffee together or something right. at a little exactly. cafe. Where where would the cafe be if exactly. we're hanging out? Mm. Oh, that's very kind. Uh, so I'll start with a question that is triggered by conversation I just had 30 minutes ago with one of my counselees, because I do philosophical counseling, I help people find their purpose in life one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I was saying, and this is something I often say, but in this case, I was leaving uh, open the possibility of another answer. But I often say there are not as many purposes as there are uh, humans on earth, right? They're not 9 billion purposes, which... Right which creates a great opportunity also for, for a higher form of community, right? So yeah. Yeah. What, um, what I would like to ask you is, do you agree with that? I, I find it a really interesting and unique question. I hadn't really thought about it before, but um, I am going to, <clears throat> I'd love to take a slight counter uh, to that by saying, yes, if you ask people to write down their purpose, a lot of it looks like greeting cards. You know, I want to change the world. I want to do good things, whatever. <clears throat> and you can lump millions of purposes into something vague in general. But I believe that a purpose, a true authentic purpose, is getting back to what Carl Jung called individuation, that you're going back to something that's quite unique about you. And while there certainly could be some overlaps, um, I would say that there may well be, um, you know, you could probably get back to an individual purpose that is completely unique. That being said, I think that the values and, I, and identity features of that purpose may have elements that are very consistent with millions of other people around the world. Am I a giver? Am I a pleasure seeker? Am I a meaning seeker? Am I a guardian? Am I an activist? Am I an achiever? Those sorts of ideas and identities that people might have may certainly um, connect with many, many millions of other people. Does that kind of make sense? Right. So if, if people uh, who start uh, listening to us wonder uh, about examples, Right of yeah. purposes. You have great examples uh, that you give yourself in your TED talk or or, or in your books. Uh, would mm -hmm. you like to? What comes on top of your mind? Yeah. Well, um, you know, my purpose, which is to help other people find purpose and direction in their lives, um, it's to also be uh, a strong family person. Uh, it's also to be a good teacher and in fact to teach my students every one of them as if they're my own daughter but also to um to get people out on the dance floor of life um to get people out uh, i think you know i don't know if you had in europe or, or did you grow up in europe louise indeed i did in paris yeah so i don't you probably didn't have these what we called sock hops, you know, where you'd in high school, you know, you'd go out and dance, you know, all these kids would go out and they'd take their shoes off in a gymnasium and they would start dancing to sometimes live music and whatever. But, you know, there were people called wallflowers and they would just, you know, stand along the wall and never dance. And they're always waiting for somebody to ask them to dance or they're too shy to dance. And it was an interesting word because wall, they're on the wall, but they're also flowers. They're beautiful. And to dance means, you know, a wallflower is waiting for someone else to bring them into life in a way. And, you know, you kind of have to do that yourself to some extent. And the other is people don't go out and dance because they think they'll make asses of themselves and other people will make fun of them. 
And one of the parts of having a purpose, I think, is that A, you're willing to go out onto the dance floor and not wait for somebody to tell you what your purpose is. You know, I'll wait for the government or the church or my family or my community or media, social media, tell me, you know, what my purpose should be. I'm going to get out there and then I've got to dance my own dance. And I can't care all that much what other people are thinking about that dance. Those are parts of my purpose. And you might see different domains of purpose in that. So I believe there are different domains. I, I don't want to turn purpose into something that is somehow ethereal and mystical. I, I think purpose is a self-organizing set of life aims that you have. And you know, I might have purpose at work, which is teaching my students as if they're my own daughter. I have purpose at home to be a, you know, a strong husband and father and grandfather and son. Um, I have purposes in my community. Uh, I have purposes in the world. I have personal purposes of having fun. All of those things are, are you know, put together in an amalgam and, and you end up, you know, basically saying, well, I have a lot of purposes and but they organize my my goals in my life they help me organize that and they think help me think prospectively and we found in our neuroscience work that there's when we ask people to think about their purposeful core values that more oxygen goes into this part of the brain called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex which is very human humans have much more of this than any other animal uh by weight and so this part of the brain relates to prospective thinking. It relates to future orientation. What are my possible selves? What are the people that I could be? And other, other animals don't seem to have that. My dog doesn't seem to have that. A dolphin doesn't seem to, have, and, and they don't change their behavior necessarily. My dog isn't gonna say, you know, I think I'm gonna be a vegetarian now, um, but humans do. Hmm. Is that making sense? Yes, I think I discovered that recently, actually, I was quite amazed uh, about the uh, what's called the science of purpose, right, which seems to be like the, yeah. sort of the, um, the miracle pill, because it's it goes from, uh, you know, aging to uh, all sorts of mental and physical uh, benefits. Now, I think what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is that for you, purpose is more a verb than an object. It's more the the act of purposefulness of aspiring rather than fetishizing a, a sort of a all encompassing value, right? For which we would sacrifice. That's uh, a great word, fetishizing. Right, <laughs> but yeah, I use a lot of um, this uh, philosophical word. Sorry, for, sorry about that. However. Someone may ask, okay, so how, when does, like if we speak of distance, right? If we think in terms of how far is the realization of the purpose, right? If I decide to make myself a coffee, it's going to take me five minutes if I have a, a coffee machine. Uh, if I decide to, um, you know, uh, to... Uh, to be good to my neighbors. Okay, that's maybe an everyday practice, but that won't take me uh, further away than you know one kilometer around. But now, if the purpose is justice for all, then we we're much more distant, right? So someone might ask, when is it of the same nature? You know, the purpose of. Uh, going to the supermarket in one hour and achieving justice for all, is it just a continuum or is there a moment where we have a qualitative jump? In that case, we would, we would try to, you know, know where, if we are beyond that mm -hmm. limit where it starts to be a real uh, purpose or not. I love the question. By the way, this is exactly why I wanted to be on this podcast, because, uh, you know, you're such a bright thinker and your philosophical terms such as fetishism, <laughs> it's great. You fetishized uh, purpose. Yeah, and I fetishize um, the conversation. I'm enjoying this, too. So let's continue. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
it's you bring up a really, really important question, and to some extent, a slight disagreement among researchers of purpose. Some researchers of purpose regard purpose as a goal or set of goals that people strongly value. You know, I, I might have a purpose of making coffee in the morning. Um, that would not be a life purpose, but it is a purpose. I mean, you know, this term itself can get in the way of itself by, by you know, the fact that it's related to almost any goal-related behavior. But most purpose researchers regard purpose as um, aspirational, aspirations. So something that's much bigger. If I'm going to teach every student as if they're my own daughter, there are some elements of that that could be achieved, I suppose, but but really not. It's it's more of a mindset, I suppose, where I'm thinking, if I have a student who is in need and I have a grant to write, you know, a grant proposal for a science, you know, National Science Foundation, I might go, well, I should ignore that student and keep my door closed. But if that student's my daughter, or if I'm the parent of that person, what would I want me to do? And I'd say, I, okay, I better make some time for this student. And so it is it is more a general um, mindset of what I'm gonna do in terms of all the conflicts that we face. And I think people don't talk enough about the fact that we face conflicts all the time. I mean, every day we have little mini conflicts. Do I want that glass of wine or should I play with the children? Do I want this glass of water um, or do I want to have a big ham and egg breakfast or whatever? You know, there's all sorts of things that I can decide. And people with strong purpose actually have less conflict. Right. They, they kind of understand that direction. We do. We put people in the MRI. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging who have strong purpose and we put people in who have a weak purpose and we give them conf messages that create conflict are intended to create conflict and there's a part of the brain the dorsal anterior cingulate which relates to conflict in the brain and purposeful people don't have activation there when conflicted they know what to do right what's interesting too is that that part of the brain the dorsal anterior cingulate is our pain center as well it's related to pain so that I find fascinating. Very often conflict may create pain. And people, sure enough, who have strong purpose, such strong sense of purpose in their lives are more resilient to pain. They can put their arms in freezing cold ice water and hold it in longer, for example, than people who don't who have a weaker purpose. I'm not sure that's answering your question, but I see it a little more as this mindset as opposed to real specific goals. Right. And I, but it does help you arrange those specific goals. It seems uh, listening to you that the mindset is about the unification of the self, isn't it? Uh, right? Uh, in the sense that a person that has uh, a purpose uh, is intentionally uh unified by a focus and therefore uh, as we know whenever we are in focus that eliminates a lot of things from our attention or awareness and and therefore a lot of possible conflicts are are eliminated right Would you that's exactly right and you used an important word intentionality um i think people with strong purpose are more intentional um and we may be intentional for example i might wake up and the first thing i do is look at what the weather is going to be like and go okay i'm going to dress in a certain way based on that weather but what if you woke up and you said wow i have to give a talk today or i have to take tickets in a subway today or i have to do something i have to be kind to my mother today uh, whatever those things are, if I start thinking a little more intentionally about even daily activities, they, those things you'd go, well, what's important? And I'm going to now set my energy, my vitality, you know, this limited resource I have toward those things that matter most. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that that's what purpose does. It's not magic, but it's, it's what, what, I find fascinating is that scientists have not taken this term seriously 
for decades and decades. And yet we just published a paper literally this week in the Journal of Gerontology showing that older people who have a strong purpose have longer epigenetic clocks. An epi your epigenome kind of is like the vinyl record on top of your hard drive of your DNA. For the longest time, in fact, in high school and college, I was taught your DNA is your DNA and that's it. That's all that's inherited. But there's this epigenome, this vinyl record that ends up getting weathered sometimes or developed sometimes over years. And parts of it may be even inheritable. And that epigenome is, can you can start looking at the epigenome and then creating a biological clock from that. And what we have found in our research is that people have longer biological clocks. In other words, our genes express more healthy proteins like antivirals and fewer proteins that are negative like uh, pro-inflammatory cells. You don't want inflammation, especially during a pandemic. Yeah. So, um, those things seem to, and, and people live longer. We found that our epigenetic clocks are longer. People live longer if they have a strong purpose. Why doesn't science, why doesn't you know, medical science take this seriously and say, we need a purpose pill. We need to figure out if this could help people live bigger, better, longer lives. Right. Because I think that's, uh, that's what philosophy has been saying for centuries and two thousand years right. yes i call it philosophical health but i don't want to get too technical here but i think the epigenome is also sensitive to uh, much more than than genome to uh my some sort of mind uh action you know uh, mm -hmm. the final mind of a matter we don't want to get too spooky here of course but still so mm -hmm. it, we don't want to give the impression that it's it's because of vi a, a, a vinyl or, or you, I, I cannot really record it. While there is some, uh, I think, evidence that, or at least claim that uh, it is wrong to think that, of course, the mind has no power at all in... Um, it, in the way we we live our lives in embodied situations so now the question is and i mean this is you know we're talking about psychosomatics we know that this yeah. is everywhere for example um if if you manifest some uh psychosomatic pain right so yeah. people usually think oh that's unhealthy oh there's there's a red spot or there's some pain that we cannot explain yeah. materially, but actually one could argue, well, this is very healthy is, is that there is a good connection, good enough connection between the mind and the body such that the body can alert things that the mind might not be able to formulate. Sure. But here we're talking about precisely, we're talking about tensions and contradictions in our life that because the life is not unified uh, in, in some uh, uh, meaningful way, mm -hmm. creates this conflicts you were talking about. But now someone could ask you, because you said in the beginning that you have several purposes. So how do this several purpose do not enter in conflict with each other? Right. You can have purpose conflict, yes. Right. <laughs> I mean, if if you follow at least my reasoning, and I might be wrong, but if you follow my reasoning that you, if you think about life purpose, life is complex and you have different domains of life. We spend most of our waking hours working typically. So, but, you know, you also then have to get home, see your family and your partner may look at you and go, you're never here. You know, I am too here. No, you're not here. You're not here present in your mind. Right. So I, you know, people use this term work-life balance, for example, to express the need to balance different domains of purpose. I don't like that because it seems like a zero-sum game. If I work real hard, I can't live. If I live real hard, I can't work. Um, I don't believe in that. I, I view it more as Venn diagrams. I view this as overlapping. Can I, for example, become a better human being personally in my personal goals that I have and my personal purpose through my work? 
can my work in a way educate me to be a better human being? And maybe I am taking tickets in a subway, but maybe I could learn to be a better human being in doing that, helping people maybe have a better day as opposed to just being, you know, acting like an automaton, which I've been hired to be essentially. So could I take that job and craft purpose from it? And there's a lot of research showing that indeed you can do that. And if you do that, you're much happier in your job, much happier in your life. That can also make you a better person. Um, you could also, for example, if you care a lot about your family, you might say, well, what is our family purpose? And how is my relation, what's my relation to my family vis-a-vis -vis that purpose? And is there some connection to a community purpose? So maybe our family decides to volunteer in the community or get into involved, excuse me, in some activity that involves community volunteerism. Those things may start connecting. Or in my work, I might say, yes, our workplace should volunteer and do certain things. I, I think that there are ways of, of reducing conflict, but I won't deny that there is sometimes conflict. I have a big purpose in my life uh, in terms of my work. I wanna help people become more purposeful. And sometimes that could interfere with my relationship with my, my wife, for example. Right. Um, just in terms of time. Right. Uh, I mean, this reminds me, it seems to like uh, philosophical quotes of the famous uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, quote, uh, hell is the others. Right. Yes. And, uh, and so that, right. is, of course, something yeah. that we all need to learn as as we live is that just the fact, I mean, being in, in the world of of otherness with with our fellow humans is is both a gift and and a curse, and a curse right but you know he also said an interesting thing he said we we know everything except how to live and you know i think he said that in a time when we're discovering so many scientific advances and in, in medicine and in astronomy we learn we're not you know live you know we're not these giant things uh, learning more about the universe expanding and, but I still don't think that we've learned how to live, which is why I appreciate you and what you've been doing, because I think that's what you're doing. You're saying there's, we need to figure that side of it out too, because we still haven't figured out how to actually live our lives. Right. And, and we're, we're describing here, not answers, but maybe an understanding that our lives are complex and they conflict. And I think Sartre was growing up in a time when increasingly, you know, just like Nietzsche was growing up in a time where increasingly there were um, people were leaving their communities, you know, that they grew up in and moving to big cities and working in, you know, in, you know, in, in industrial factories and killing themselves. And, and, you know, just they're losing all sense of purpose and that was handed down to them. I think Sartre, you know, and his predecessor in a way, the proto-existentialist Friedrich Nietzsche said, you know, we have to now figure out our own purpose. We have to create our own light. Is that making sense to you as a yeah, philosopher? I think you're right. I think that's what they have in common is that uh, they pointed uh, also with Kierkegaard, they pointed mm. the vertigo and anxiety of realizing that meaning is not given as we thought before the death of God, right? Uh, yeah, I'm using qu uh, qu quotes here, but yeah, from me, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and then there is this rediscovery of of a form of um, optimism and and joy, which is the the joy of realizing. Well, then, if meaning is not given, let's let's try to to be sense givers. Uh, but what is interesting is that. You were talking about technology. You were talking about the influence of of, of industrialization on this uh, realization, also of the absurdity sometimes of norms that are imposed upon us, right? Purposes that are not our purpose, because this is something we should also talk about, right? Uh, there's no such thing as a, a human without a a um, 
values or worldviews. It's just that sometimes we are alienated to values that are not ours. So uh, we can't pretend, and that's very Sartrean, right? We can't pretend to live without values. We can't be that person that says, I don't care about philosophy. I don't care about ideology because that's we're made of this uh, ideology. So now coming back to that technology uh, importance, uh, of course, in our lives, it's interesting because, of course, today everybody's talking about AI, right? And um, even the uh, the big experts in AI are now saying, well, the problem of AI is, is human, is that we've never been, it's exactly what you're saying, we've never been very good at defining our purposes. It's, um, mm-hmm. you know, there's uh, uh, Stuart Russell's uh, book, Human Compatible. Uh, he quotes the famous myth of the genie and the three wishes. Usually in many cultures, we're given three wishes and it doesn't end well, right? We we, we get all confused and we ask yeah. for, for the wrong right. Uh, things. So this moment of of emerging technologies that seem to be uh, giving some structure, some meaningful structure to our lives, I think it's more than ever a a call to to you know to sort of be responsible for the directions and the deep orientations that we give to our lives. But having said that, I I think that someone might still ask, you know, someone might still say, well, this doesn't seem sufficient enough to have like a set of purposes that we hope won't be in conflict and basically which have to do to be with being a good person, right? Uh, Or you mentioned the example of dancing, uh, mm-hmm. in your own dance pre, yeah. yeah pre-organized uh very normative uh, activities someone might say i don't care about being a good person and we've seen that in history a lot sure i sure. want equality for all or i want justice for all and it's all or nothing and if we have to kill uh, uh, one million people to achieve that we'll do it so how do we, where do we stop, right? To you know, like half an hour ago, we were asking, where does it start? Where does purpose start? And now I'm, go- I'm gonna ask, where does it end? Where, when do we know that we're not falling into some form of dogmatism? It, uh, in fact, it's such a beautiful question. Years ago, I was invited to the city of Heidelberg, Germany, because Heidelberg wanted to become more purposeful. <laughs> And so they invited, it's, it was a great gig because um, we went out into the mountains into this, you know, 15th century uh, uh, convent, I believe it was. And we talked about it. And I remember there are all these people from the city of Heidelberg there, as I was talking about purpose. And I was talking especially about transcending purpose, purpose that would transcend oneself and and how that was healthy for you and we found you know some health benefits of a transcending purpose and somebody raised their hand and said well you know hitler had a purpose and and it just struck me like boom uh i didn't really think about that but hitler had a transcending purpose i'm sure quite sure that hitler was willing to die for his purpose um people in al-qaeda or other other you know organizations are willing to kill many people and you could argue certain countries are as well but you know we won't get into that debate hopefully or discussion but you certainly know there are people thinking that they have a very transcending purpose and i struggled with that actually honestly there is um in heidelberg there's uh there's a, a mountain there right at Heidelberg and there's a, a pathway that goes up the mountain. It's called philosopher's way. <laughs> and, and it's amazing because a lot of famous, I think, believe Goethe walked up this. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to walk up here and try to find an answer. And I went up and I meditated actually for, um, I think about an hour or so. And I started just, I literally sat up there for a long time. And it's not that somehow an answer just came to me, but I started thinking about Nietzsche's um, 
parable in the beginning of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where it begins with a camel and the camel says, you know, load everything on me, load all the the sorrows and the difficulties and the joys and love, load everything. In other words, educate me, completely educate me. And then the camel metamorphosizes into a lion. The lion goes into the wilderness and there's this dragon on every scale has two words, thou shalt. In other words, you shall do what the government is saying. You shall do what the church is saying. You shall do what your parents said, blah, blah, blah. It's all, you know, this is what your purpose should be. The lion slays the dragon and then met metamorphosizes one last time into a child, a child innocent of values. It's interesting you mentioned before, it's almost impossible not to have values. And that's where I would say Nietzsche, I don't think Nietzsche right, had it right at the end. I don't think you can live without, I don't think you can somehow be reborn with no values and construct entirely your own values. I think that's ridiculous personally. But um, this idea of educating yourself is very important. And so I turn to my students and say, you're all camels. I'm a camel. I will always be a camel, but I am here always to learn. And I won't learn just from taking a class. I'll learn from going out into the real world and learning how real people live, learning how poor people live, learning how people die, learning how to make a canoe uh, learning how to be a bartender, learning how to be a nurse, learning the more experiences, real life experiences you can get, the better educated you are. And that gives you a stronger transcending purpose that in, I don't, I don't know if philosophers must hate the word good, but a good purpose, a, a purpose that somehow transcends and is helpful. But you see people who they may have PhDs, but they can still be in a terrorist organization and believe in things that destroy a lot of humanity. And I don't believe they're real camels. I don't think they've really educated themselves. They might have in engineering, but not in the world. Is that making sense? I have struggled with that very issue. No, I, I think you're right. And um, many people, even in the history of philosophy, struggle with that. It's the famous uh, moral law of Kant, right? Where he said, where where he he thought that if you if you have a higher value, you, you need to make sure that it it can become universal. Ah, uh, I see. And and so right, and so he he always had this sense of it's not only about thinking for yourself, which is good, but it's also about thinking into the place of the other. Ah. Uh. So, what we might call empathy. Well, intellectual empathy, because yeah, yeah, you know, there is there is a, we live in an over emotionalist uh, time, and and if you say empathy, a lot of people might think, oh, it's about uh, feeling sorry uh, for the other. It's right. We agree that, but what is interesting is that, I mean, in in the philosophical health view, sometimes people ask me, oh, okay, so it's a new dogmatism. You're going to tell. You're going to say who is philosoph philosophically healthy and who is not. But in fact, uh, this doesn't apply because philosophy is not only, philosophy has two legs. One leg is about trying to find indeed this overarching uh, you know, explanation that will, will give you so much purpose there is clarify everything, right? But the other leg, it's it's the opposite, is the questioning, is the doubting, is the capacity to, to be able to think, well, I think I might think this, but someone else might think differently, the curiosity for the other. And, and I think that philosophy is, is constantly trying to deal with these two aspects, like the whole, trying to give a, a big narrative to give a story that explains the whole, the totality, but at the same time, care for the other with a big O, right? The other. I, I love what you're saying, and I'm learning something here. That's that's really interesting. That there are two sides of of philosophy. Because I'm not a philosopher, but I'm, you know, I enjoy reading philosophy and. This idea of, you know, I think Socrates said something like, you know, I I know I don't know or something, you know, related to how important it is to 
admit that you don't know. Um, and there is that as, but, but he was always curious, always questioning, always. And I think keeping that open mind and that humility that we really don't know things, but at the same time, there may be things we can do in our lives that help organize our lives in a responsible way that make us happy. I mean, that was Aristotle's real question in Nicomachean Ethics, I believe. What makes us happy? And, you know, one thing we found in our research very clearly is that hedonic uh, goals do not necessarily make us happy in the long run. Um, we run into this hedonic treadmill where, you know, it's never enough. It's never enough. Um, ne never enough good wine, never enough good food, never enough good sex, never enough good vacations, whatever. It's just, you know, it gets every time you engage in those things, there's a diminishing return. And we have found that now, even in our physiology, when we look at our physiologic uh, gene expression. So I just, I love what you're saying about philosophical health. I, I wish people thought more about that. I wish medicine thought more about it. Um, because I, I don't think we're, you know, I, th I believe it was um, uh, Marcus Aurelius who said, don't live your life as if you're going to live 10,000 years. But the promise of medicine and public health is that we'll live 10,000 years, that we'll live at least 100 years or 150 years. And all these new books about longevity and how we can live longer. What will we do in those years? Will we? I, to me, I think we're just stretching them out in a way and making each year thinner. It's kind of like if we have $10,000 versus $5, each dollar is worth more if you have $5 than if you have $10,000. And so you kind of throw away those $10,000. Each dollar is hardly worth anything. And I think that's what we're doing increasingly. We're throwing our dollars away on social media, on what is Kim Kardashian wearing today? Really, who cares? Uh, you know, what these social influencers who have no necessary, not necessarily no skill sets, you know, to really learn from and being a better human being. Like, why do I care what that influencer is doing? But we're spending more time on that. So that, I think that's one of the motivations for what I do. Mm. I think this is very interesting because we know that evolutionary for a long time, we we lived 20, 30, 35 years. And it could be that the amount of years we're given only makes us more superficial and, and vain and, and anecdotic. Uh, I know that that resonates also with your personal history, which you have not been uh, hiding in your books. I don't know if we want right, to get into right. that, but... Um, sure. I don't mind. Right. It, this is up to you. But be, uh, before that, I, I think that we have something really interesting there, which is the idea of reward, right? The idea of enjoyment. So some young people might think, oh, OK, great. Uh, looks cool. Uh, having a purpose is going to make me live longer uh, uh, and be successful. Let's have a purpose. And then, of course, they might go for something that makes them feel immediately good, right? Uh, yeah. And so, uh, and uh, you have, I mean, uh, at least uh, in my uh, consultations, I have a lot of people who want shortcuts, right? The, the young people, they seem to want shortcuts in a society that uh, has, uh, you write, I mean, you mentioned this, the, the fake celebrities, society has this strong narrative of people who become extremely rich uh, or notorious f for doing nothing. Right. 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 I, I think one of the first, I mean, I don't know, but I remember when I was young, it was this Paris Hilton who her, she oh, was yeah. famous for That's being a perfect happy, case. Right. That's a perfect case. So, and, and so, of course, uh, because we are in this democratic times, everybody wants equality. So, everybody wants to claim some shortcut to a privileged state uh, and, and um, sort of eliminate the effort it takes to to get in a place that really fulfills all the dimensions of who we are and i think that there there is a a sort of a, a thin line between of course 
we're not advocating masochism, right? We're not advocating this, like being for 30 years, this hyper-disciplined person who, who gets right. burned out uh, because uh, she or he have this uh, big purpose, but in fact, uh, renunciates the everyday here and now for that. But we also don't want to advocate uh, the cult of happiness in the sense that today people seem to think that uh, happiness uh, should uh, or, or joy or enjoyment uh, are the best measures of of us being on the right track. Which goes right back to Nicomachean ethics by Aristotle, who said, well, there there is hedonism and Epicurus was one of the founders of that movement where pleasure is so important. And but Aristotle said, that's fine. It's fine to seek pleasure. We, we all are pleasure seekers and that's good. But if that's all we are, and I think I'm quoting him, said, then we're like grazing animals. And we all like to graze um, on good food or good wine or good sex or good travel or good whatever. Those things are good. We all enjoy those things. That's wonderful. But he also talked about eudaimonic well-being, eudaimonia, being in touch with your inner daemon, this godlike or true self that the Greeks thought we were born with. And if we can get in touch with that inner daemon, then we are more deeply happy. And that is that eudaimonia is what leads to happiness. That's, I think, where purpose is, you know, you can have different purposes. You can have Paris Hilton probably has some purposes or did. And, you know, she was more directed toward hedonic pleasure. And then she ran through probably, you know, I, I'm guessing she probably went through some crises as a result of that, because after a while, it becomes so thin your life becomes so thin um so but eudaimonia requires work as you're implying not necessarily masochistic work but certainly effort i think you know philosophy is interesting i i wasn't at all philosophical uh in this way in until my daughter passed away uh 10 years 13 years ago which i can get to in a second but i i didn't really even think about these issues and when i started thinking about purpose and the more i read about it the more i realized this is powerful stuff this isn't just something that you can take a philosophy class okay now i know what aristotle said or whatever it's powerful it's also dangerous even you know, people can go down rabbit holes of philosophy and end up really becoming very depressed or they can they can you can turn your life around through philosophy, philosophy and philosophical thinking for good or for for your own detriment, I believe. So it's a powerful thing I've learned that I didn't respect philosophy before. Now I have the utmost respect for what you do and, and what and how philosophy has worked in my life anyway right and i can see you have you have uh, read all the good references in um i think one of those good references more contemporary is a wonderful book uh, that you you of course know by anna arendt uh, human condition where she does uh come back to the idea very aristotelian idea that what makes us really human is politics is entering into debate and action to make the world a better place as yeah. opposed to the movement that she identifies since the 18th century which she calls domestication really which echoes what you were saying about becoming animals again so we domesticate ourselves because we have reversed this the priority and the domestic, the family, the house uh, becomes the highest priority, uh, yeah. the private sphere. But mm -hmm. as she says very nicely, the private sphere is a sphere that is deprived. It's deprived of com community in the sense of action uh, towards um, our ideals, which connects, I think, nicely to what you were saying about why also some people who feel attracted to philosophy 
uh, end up being lonely or or felt misunderstood or rejected. I fight for those people because I believe that in a way the our entire society today is is organized such to avoid to that people think right. So it's da- it's a dangerous. Wow. I think it's Anna Arendt who said philosophy is very dangerous, as you as you also yeah. uh, mentioned, and that's we need to help. When I was twenty, when I or, or eighteen, when I decide to to do philosophy, everyone was against me, including my parents, very violently. Yeah. And the the sense I had is okay. So there's something wrong. There must be something wrong with me. Uh, I'm going to be a loser. I'm going. I will I'll be out of of a job, etc. And I think today people are realizing, perhaps, or or maybe I'm being optimistic. I don't know, but that that aspiration to interrogate things, don't not take things for granted, and also aspire for meaning, aspire for a purpose that is not just something private and personal, but that I think we all carry in us this idea that we would like to get closer to paradise on earth. And it can be a dangerous idea, as you said yourself. Perhaps Hitler, I'm not sure, but you know, very bad people have thought about getting us closer to paradise on earth in ways that were wrong. But I think we have that it's in us. We because we live on this planet, we we want we have a, an intuition that can be very uh, unconscious that can be very buried under uh, all the um, the norms that that we are, uh, yeah. you know, c- called to espouse. But I think we all so have- you're saying society doesn't want us to be philosophers in a way. I think so. Yeah, and and the way it, it, wow. it it's like you could even see the entire industry of entertainment or or but also corporate where as a huge system uh that is targeted at preventing us from thinking and what do you do with people like us who whom you can't uh prevent from thinking you put them in academia and then you give them rewards oh you you've been an assistant professor now you're going to be an associate professor in five years and and we we play that game so we we might end up being neutralized too that's so true too. In fact, um, I, I thought long ago about what might be on my headstone and I started realizing it would be the number of journal articles that I wrote and the amount of National Institute of Health grant money that I brought in and my frequent flyer miles. And and I started realizing, or just asking myself the simple question, is that what I want on my headstone? Is that what I want my legacy to be? And I realized no, I've got it. I want to be doing much, much more than that, and breaking out of that academic comfort zone, uh, which which it does. It's very, very comfortable being an academic, and your students are, you know, so nice to you all the time, of course. But breaking out of that and getting into the real world and trying to make change is a messy business, and it can be sometimes painful. But it's so important to, I think, being for me, I think I believe I become a better professor if I get out into the real world and I try to help people in the real world, uh, not just teach a course. I think I've become a better teacher. But anyway, that's an aside. Um, I love the fact that this really struck me that society really is against philosophy in a way. Society would much rather have you fall into certain tracks of clones of other people, a Paris Hilton clone or a whatever, you know, a hero clone, you know, certain archetypes, you just fall into those things and society supports that. I want to be the rich person, you know, I want to be the hardworking person, whatever. And yet to question all of those things, to go back and say, well, we're here on this planet for this brief period of time, what are we doing? Are we just going to simply be automaton based on what society has dictated for us? So, yeah, society, uh, philosophy is kind of a fight, isn't it? It, It's kind of a fight against that. You're talking about 
um, how fragile and ephemeral life is. Uh, I mean, I have a daughter myself, and I think mm. you, you, your experience, as you, as you tell in your books, is correct me if I'm wrong. Both one of a, a miracle, and then, of course, right, uh, yeah, <laughs> both. from a fate, right? So, yeah. your daughter was given the chance to live much more than you expected. Uh, yeah. when she was born she has this heart problem but then at the same time uh, her life uh, ended um, in her youth and yeah. so that's not how people live right people live as if they were eternal but you sort of were at the core of that mystery of being human that in fact we are floating uh, above uh, nothingness, right? And uh, how do you, how does that connect to you insisting so much on people having a sense of purpose? Yeah, what a wonderful question. Um, yeah, just to put this into context, my daughter was uh, born healthy. She caught a chickenpox virus when I was on sabbatical in Maastricht in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, she, this chicken pox virus attacked her heart. It destroyed her heart. And her only hope was to get a heart transplant. And she became one of the early children to get a heart transplant as a child. And we didn't know, you know, we, we knew her chance actually of becoming six years old was about 25%. And she made it through that. She needed another heart when she was 10, uh, nine, I'm sorry. And then she died very suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 19. Um, I think you put it into such beautiful perspective that it it was almost thrust on me, the fact that we are here briefly on this planet, whereas most people can, can kind of float through that. They don't have to think about those things. We were forced into thinking about it. So I don't claim any genius or any special intelligence in this. This is simply my environment being forced on me that changed how I think about things. And I started thinking about the existential nature of our, uh, you know, of, of, of living. And I started thinking with her especially, well, we're going to make every day a special day for her. Not like we're going to go to Disney World every day and meet actors and things like that. It, it was more, we're just going to make sure that she lives a big life, a full life. And we're going, and that kind of transferred to all of us. We started living bigger lives ourselves. It, it's almost like my life moved from black and white into technicolor. And I started really enjoying my life more. I started moving outside of academia and the comfort zone of academia and started doing a lot more work outside of academics and thoroughly enjoyed that. And so I started living a bigger, richer life. When she died suddenly, a big part of my purpose, which was to give her a bigger life, suddenly kind of snapped. And I was even under the illusion to some extent that there might have been some sort of force that was helping. And I'm not, a, uh, I'm very agnostic religiously, by the way, but I wondered whether there's some type of force that was keeping her going for some bigger reason that she had. And when she died, a lot of that kind of exploded or imploded. And so I did find myself uh, in a kayak two miles out on Lake Michigan, which is a very large lake, by the way, if you haven't been there, you can't see the other side, it's 87 miles. And, you wow. know, I was thinking of continuing on to the other side of the lake, which of course I would have died. Um, but I had, I don't know how else to say this, uh, an epiphany experience when I was two miles out. And it related to, it was almost like there was a crossroads right there that came up that said, you can go this way and you'll die. And I, I was, this is just two months after she had died. And I had, I was so numb. I had no feeling whatsoever about feeling fear of dying. I, I thought this may be a really, really smart thing to do, to die or to live. But I realized that if I was going to live, I'd really have to change my life rather significantly because I was starting to drink a lot uh, of alcohol I was watching television all the time. I was watching whatever Kim Kardashian was on, which I think is a sure sign you're getting ready to die. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like my life was exploded and I didn't care about anything. 
there was something about that very experience where I thought, wait, I have agency here. I actually have, I can decide whether to die or not. And society has told us we should never even think about dying. I had that opportunity two miles out to say, I might decide to die or I might decide to live. And that very agency that I started feeling kind of helped me. And I thought, okay, I'm going to decide to live. And I think I can decide to live in a different life. So I went back and I started thinking more about that. I started reading philosophy, actually. I started reading Seneca and Seneca's letter to, uh, it's a famous letter, his letter to Marsha. Marsha, and this, by the way, is 2000 years old, but Marsha had lost her 16 year old son. And Seneca was kind of the, you know, the counselor, almost the newspaper counselor of, or advisor to people. We have somebody in the U.S. named Ann Landers. And Ann Landers, you know, you'd write Ann Landers and go, oh, my husband left me or whatever. And Ann Landers would write something consoling what to do. So Seneca, I believe, was kind of like that. He wrote this letter. And it, I read this letter and it and it moved me so much and it helped me so much in thinking about the fact that we're here for this brief time and we should really make the most of it. And now I regard my daughter's life as a gift to me. Um, I, we did what we could to give her a big life and she did live a big life, but I can still um, benefit from her life by not necessarily letting that death destroy me. I, I can learn from that and learn how to live a bigger life and then teach, hopefully help other people live bigger lives. Right, and then becomes a uh, your daughter's life becomes a gift to others also. Hopefully, yeah, that's that's my intention. Yes, and I think we it I think it's a good conclusion, at least for this first conversation. It sounds like we might have more. But I've read very much enjoyed it, by the way, Louise. Yeah, uh, equally, and I, I anticipated this. Uh, perhaps I'll finish because this is connected. You have this beautiful image of the fortress of the ego that we carry around our head like a castle. And um, and I think it's interesting because as you were saying, when you were desperate and and looking at uh, celebrities on television, et cetera, at the same time, you were feeling sorry for, for yourself. Uh, correct yeah, no. sure. And I think yeah. that that's the thing with the, the ego is that in fact, uh, it, when you have too much of it, you uh, you don't have enough of it at the same time. And I think what purpose brings is that by identifying to something that is higher than yourself, that you admire, uh, it it lifts you up, right? You say you transcend uh, exactly, and and you say it, that you were in the middle of that lake. You you I, I heard it. You said that you heard as if the voice of your daughter saying, get over it, uh, yes. and the meaning of over, uh, yes. above, right? And I think we can conclude on that, is that those people who might now wonder, okay, so how do I how do I get purpose? I have a lot of people contact me, they want philosophical consultations to try to define their purpose. And I always have them reflect on what they admire, uh, for Descartes, let's finish with a philosopher that I think everybody knows. Actually, I thought everybody knows, but I see with students that people have forgotten about uh, uh, I think, therefore I am, right? The, the famous motto from, from Descartes. Yeah. And he had this essay on emotions, and, he's, and he says that, that the primordial, the core emotion of all is admiration. And I think that's uh, very unheard, but I, I do agree with that. The sense of admiration is what elevates us uh, to what may become uh, one day uh, a sense of purpose. You know, it's so funny you say that. I, I've been, so many people come to me and say, okay, I understand how you formed a purpose, but I don't want a horrible thing happening to me in order to find a purpose. I get that totally. Right. So how do I find purpose without something awful happening, I often will 
suggest to people, look at individuals who you would like to emulate or some of the values or characteristics of people you would like to emulate, alive or dead. And I think that's related to this. I mean, you you form certain, I mean, all of us, I'm guessing, have certain people that we admire. And, and Aristotle talked about this. In fact, he said, we shouldn't imitate other people, but we should try to emulate certain characteristics of people who we admired a lot. Is that kind of what you're saying? Completely. And I think that there is this element uh, of deep uh, engagement in real admiration that does magic. I mean, something starts to happen that uh, indeed goes well beyond the uh, the laws of matter. That is fascinating. Shall we pause here our conversation and, and perhaps um, uh, go for an episode two in a few months? I really would enjoy that very much. Um, I it, It's rare for me to be able to talk to somebody who has the depth of philosophical knowledge you have. Um, I work with a lot of scientists, but and even people in our own philosophy department at the University of Michigan, there are some wonderful people there. But in terms of their focus on what you're doing, I don't see that. And so it's a real pleasure to get to meet you and know you, talk to you a little more. And I hope uh, that sometime we can even meet in a real cafe sometime and have coffee together. Exactly. And and I mean, I really admire the, in the insistence you put on sense of purpose. To be uh, transparent, the reason why I contacted you and discovered you is that um, I came up with this um, last year. I was doing a study with people who uh, live have been living for many years with a spinal cord injury as tetraplegic. So 90%, oh, yeah. uh, 95% of their body is paralyzed. Yeah. And yet, uh, these people that I interviewed, they they really developed a very high sense of the possible, and and they reinvented themselves. And I was trying to understand why, and if there was some element of philosophical health that helped them. And in doing so, I devised this method of dialogue, which I use also in my consultations, which which goes uh, through six steps. Uh, start with the bodily sense. And then I move to the sense of self, asking you, well, what do you feel about it? How do you sense yourself? Then the sense of belonging. Then comes the sense of the possible, which for me, it's very core to definition of health. We were talking about medicine. Well, if you have a high sense of the possible, you are healthy, even if you're uh, paralyzed uh, physically. And then after the sense of the possible, I ask about, we talk about the sense of purpose. And then lastly, the philosophical sense. So I think we should even uh, collaborate some sometime more on this. I think there is a yeah. uh, a high, um, you know, uh, likelihood that in through the idea of purpose, there can be a real bridge between, uh, you know, the uh, experimental sciences and and the more uh, qualitative approach that uh, very much there's actually some research looking at purpose among people with spinal cord injuries um right. and i'd be happy to send some to you if you would like but that's a fascinating area to me i have another question too um as i think you might know i have a, a app called Purposeful. It's an application. And within Purposeful, I have a purpose cast that I do, a podcast, not unlike this. Um, and I'm wondering whether if, either I could interview you in the next one in that purpose cast, or I could take this recording. And if it would be okay with you, we'd love to put it into Purposeful because we have you know many thousands of people who listen to experts in this area and you're truly an expert and I, I loved our conversation that's great and and uh, i'll put this on youtube and and i'll i'll give oh, you great uh, also the the sound uh if it's a podcast and and of course you can reuse it i think i'll stop the recording now thanking you yeah. again uh very much for this um and uh i i, I think i'm going to continue uh reading also your more scientific uh, papers, because I think that uh, there's really something that people should take also 
seriously researchers such that we move a little bit away from uh, all the new wave. There's, I mean, every 10 years, there's a new wave of uh, materialism, right? So now yes. we're going to fix yeah. people with AI. So every time we have to, you know, again, to fight for uh, for the soul of things. So thanks yeah. again a lot. Thank you, Louise. Real pleasure.